Good. Well, I don't know it's good morning or good afternoon because it is just past midday, 12 noon on Friday, which means that it's time for my uh, regular uh, live broadcast on Facebook, Lessons in Leadership. Good afternoon, everybody. My name's Mary Gregory. I'm very delighted to um, welcome today Joe Gregory. And uh, he's going to share with us in a minute about le his lessons in leadership or his big turning point moment. I want to clarify, which Joe did very care um, well on, on social media, that we are not related, are we, Joe? <laughs> no, we're not. <laughs> as far as I know. <laughs> we haven't found that connection yet. Maybe we, no. should, we have to go and look for it. I'm from the northeast. Where are you from? Birmingham originally, so not not too far. That like we're kind of headed in the right direction. Yeah, but yeah. different part of the country for sure. So, um, yeah, we may find a connection if we, if we dug around enough. But I mean, uh, the only I, relationship I would say is obviously we published you, so you've got an amazing book called yeah. Ego. So we've yeah. got a relationship in that sense, but not in a not in a bloodline sense, as far as we know. No, no we have we've got a very good work relationship. So that's brilliant. And you were fantastic with me actually in publishing that book. Because, you know, it's it's not the easiest thing to navigate. And t certainly, you know, talk about ego. Your own ego starts getting activated through <laughs> all that process. You were always so encouraging, which was fantastic. Oh, really pleased. That's great. So I'm really delighted to have you here today. And um, I'm going to just put up the banner so that we have we, we know who you are and where you're from. You're from Rethink Pre Press. You're an author, a publisher, you're actually a co-founder of, of Rethink Press and you're a, re, you're a builder of books. And I, I read that you've published or been responsible for publishing more than 500 books. Yeah. Yeah. Since 2003, which is when I published my own first book. So, yeah. Yeah. It's been a while. Yeah. Well, it's great to have you here. And I want to kick off really by inviting you to share just a brief history or, or background of how you got to be where you are now. Yeah, it's well, well, I'll say I'll start right from by saying that I'm an accidental publisher. I never set out to be a publisher and I didn't train to be a publisher. That kind of happened. But if I go all the way back, um, I trained as a graphic designer um, and I came from a, a, you know, a relatively low income working family, a working class family. And university just wasn't an option for me. It just didn't seem to be working out. So armed with a, um, a portfolio and a college education. So NVQ, if they even exist anymore. Um, I went looking for a job in advertising. So I had my art, my graphic design portfolio. And I think even then I was kind of into marketing. So whereas most people would be like looking through job boards and trying to find things, I had this cunning plan of doing a direct mail. So I made this CV and I, I went through and found every company that did graphic design or anything that looked like advertising in Birmingham. And I sent them all a copy of my CV with a covering letter. And so I was kind of doing direct mail um, and I, I managed... I think the response rate, I think I sent 80. And I got two people, two people respond that gave me an interview and I managed to get a job from one of them. So it's not a great hit rate, but it was my first attempt at marketing, I suppose, marketing myself. Well, I think um, that's fantastic, actually, to have the guts to do that and to just keep going with it as well. Well, uh, it's kind of cluelessness. I, never, I, I think a lot of the things I've done is because I didn't know any better. So I, I did that and I worked and I really enjoyed it. I worked in advertising for a year in an advertising agency, a small agency that worked for much bigger agencies. And I learned the basic skills, you know, how to use the software that, that graphic designers use. And it was a small, brilliant team, you know, kind of 20 people in this company. Um, and just part way through it, I just thought, I, I can't see myself doing this for the rest of my life, like having to go to work every day and commute and be told to sit there and do this for that amount of time. There's nothing wrong with the business. The business is great. I just thought, I don't think I, I've got it in me. So yeah. within a year, over a year, I didn't have a single day off. I was like a, a model employee. I'd kind of got to know the boss and I found out he'd started a business when he was just 19. And I was kind of getting to 19 at that stage. Um, and I, it kind of sparked this idea. Maybe I could start a business. Maybe you can just start a business. Mm. And so on the side, I, I've always been a big self-educator, reading books and, and doing things, which is why I love books so much. Um, I read a book on copyright and I read a book on web design and I started making websites and this was like, we're talking 1997. So it was just when the World Wide Web was getting started. Yes. Right, I've kind of figured this out. I can actually make a website. So as a kind of side project, I did a website project for somebody and they paid me more than I got paid for a month for one website. And it took me a few hours. And so I'm like, the, the, the brain kind of went, I could actually make a much better living doing that rather than doing what I'm doing. So inspired by my boss, that you can start a business. I didn't really know how to do it. 
um, I started a business and it was called Cabal, C-A-B-A-L. We always got, because we were in Birmingham, there was a, a cable company called Birmingham Cable. We often got called from Yellow Pages asking for people to sort out their telephone or or their TV, cable TV. Um, but it was us and we were always called Cable. We, we never got the name right. Um, my sister then joined the business. She's She's a bit older than me and a lot more experienced than me. She joined the business about three months in because I very quickly realized this is kind of the ongoing story. I needed a grown up to work with me. <laughs> so I started it. I got a few clients and I thought I need a I need a grown up to front this to actually look responsible when we're we're out pitching for work and to actually manage mm -hmm. me because I am chaos. Um, my, my natural approach to doing things is quite chaotic and emergent. It's not necessarily planned out in advance um, oh well emergent though that's that's one of the um on trend words at the moment isn't yeah. it with all this uncertainty and the yeah. need for leaders to be able to work in a more emergent way oh, well i love uncertainty i think that's the thing as well i'm fine with uncertainty which is useful um, yeah and and i and it's been a challenge like i, I, I don't mind telling i was I came to your show two minutes before it started and I, I'm conscious, I'm so sorry for doing that, that just because I'm fine with that kind of uncertainty, I assume everybody else is and I'm learning over time, not everybody else is. So you've got to make yeah. sure you can provide certainty. Yeah. I know this is about leadership for the people around you by communicating clearly and, and yes. giving them certainty, even if you're quite comfortable with it yes. kind of emerging and, yes. and happening. So. Yeah, I, I started the business. We we managed to win some really big clients, like big, big clients in insurance really early on. So I went from a 19 year old with a couple of websites thinking I'm earning a bit more than my mates. And I'm glad I didn't go to university at that point. I was thinking I'm glad I didn't do that because I'd be waiting another three or so years to get started um, to very quickly thinking I'm out of my depth. We need more people. So over yeah. three years, we grew the team to 12 people. So my sister was really the grown up, I, I suppose, in a in a sense, she was the business manager. Yes. Um, and she's also I mean, she's able to go into the chaos and emergent as well. But she's also got that stability that I didn't have there. And I don't think it's just age. We, we obviously still talk now. She's just got a slightly better, Different. better tuned <laughs> brain than me, I think. Different set of strengths, which is what it's all about, is, is, yeah. is being able to. That's why a diverse workforce is so important that you can play to each other's strengths. Yeah. And that yeah. you recognised you needed somebody who had those qualities to yeah. bring that well, in. Again, it comes it comes back to books. So I through this because my my main thing was selling stuff through copy. So writing brilliant websites that actually worked for people and converted into sales. So I'd read every book on direct marketing by this point. That was my passion. Um, I I love making words do stuff. So I trained in NLP and I trained for one specific purpose, which was to just make the copy better. And so it's kind of a bit of a meme. <laughs> a mean reason i'm like how how many words can i use to sell something a bit more effectively? NLP, then for you that made the copy better um it was the meta model so the meta model so being able to get very specific about the language people yeah. were using what yeah. did that actually mean so if they say i want it more professional on the one side so when they say more professional sometimes you'd find out what they wanted was the color blue but if you didn't know to ask professional yeah. how specifically and you didn't know yeah. how to dig you'd never find that and you could be putting kind of creative concepts to them all day so it was useful on the the client briefing side to go into into detail with the meta model stuff yes but in terms of selling being able to go general and this is why i i am good at naming things i think that's my one special power is giving names to things okay um you know to sell them um is being able to use the the meta model to go more abstract to become more abstract yes. just to the point where people go that's meaningful to me Yes. But actually, when you when you think about it, it, it's meaningful to everybody, but in their own way. And we don't really know the differences. So it was really powerful. Like words like success, and actually knowing whether you should drill down or whether actually it's better to keep it at that level of abstraction yes. um, in the copy. So that's it was really, really that's a real gift, actually, because because yeah. because I, I, I get and you've contributed this to me. I mean, ego traps, I think, was one of the words you used with me that made me open my eyes think, yeah, that's what it is. And that's now in my yeah. book now. There's something about you have a talent for the language and to make it appealing to lots of people. Yeah. So it quickly resonates with lots of people. So yeah, and it comes from reading yeah. loads of books and practicing. It's not like, you know, I don't think it's an, an innate ability, but I've got quite good at, at kind of jumping around these kind of parameters to try and find the, the sweet spot for the word that's yes. going to land. Um, yes. It's why I'm a big fan of cliches, you know, visual cliches on covers, on book covers. I, I'm going a bit into book covers now. Are great because that is the language. There is yeah. no other word for 
uh, c connection or selling than a handshake. Yeah. That is yes. vis vis visual language. And so although you go, oh, I don't want it to be kind of corny, sometimes you're like, well, what do you want? Do you want it to jump into somebody's brain or not? And so, yeah, so just as a sideline, I did lots of NLP, but I came across a fantastic process called the Lab Profile by somebody called Shelley Rose Charvet. And I've used this ever since to just tune in. I know what I'm good at. So this this kind of maps people's preferences for how they they communicate and how they see the world. So there are scales like big picture detail. Um, yeah. There are scales like uh, towards and away from motivation. And I, I've got those kind of mapped for what I am. So I've always looked for the opposite when I try and find people to partner with. It's like, where am I lacking? Where have, have yes. I got something that somebody else could do it? And I tend to find people that would be seen as the extreme opposite. So, cause I'm quite extreme on some of these, these parameters. I'm quite extreme in one direction. So I tend to find people that are extreme in the other direction, which I hope creates balance. And I think that's why I like collaborating with people. Um, yeah. So yeah, so we did that. Deb's, Deb's my sister really made sure the business worked properly. We had all these employees and then over kind of three years, we, the business lasted for six years. I got to a point where I'm like, I don't want to commute anymore. I've created the exact thing I didn't want to be doing for myself. I'm now the boss of a thing that I'm actually employed by. And it was the same. I just created a job for myself. Yes. And, and I realized that. And and in the process, I mean, I was 23 when we had 12 employees. I didn't have a clue how to manage. Lead. I mean, let alone lead. Um, I was flying by the seat of my pants and I didn't have any formal training in that. And I didn't have any real expertise in that. So it, it was kind of chaotic. Okay, um, well, even with the best, you know, the best lesson. partner. Let's come to your turning point lesson in a minute. I just want to acknowledge that Ganesh is here and, and welcome Ganesh and also Tracy Ann Barker are both here, which is great to have them online with us and watching as we're doing this. And Tracy Ann was just acknowledging, first of all, how great it is to have an inspirational boss, but also, you know, being able to recognize that you needed different strengths in the business yeah. over and above your own. And Ganesh is really enjoying your story, finding it very inspiring. Oh, bless you, Ganesh. Ganesh is actually helping us with some of our marketing. He's a, he's a genius. Oh, that's so, brilliant. Uh, good to see you. And, and creating balance as teams, um, Trey San has just brought up, creating balance and having collaboration present, very, very important. She's kind of reinforcing there as well, definitely mm -hmm. advisable. So I want to acknowledge you sound like a classic entrepreneur from that point of view, from, from very early on. You know, you learnt your lessons very quickly from that inspirational boss, and then you went out on your own, and you you were you know infinitely successful. You knew when to bring in people um, to support your talent and do things that you couldn't necessarily do. So you brought in mixed strengths to make the bis business more round, and it just sounds amazing. Yeah. What I'm now curious about is that turning point moment for you then, you know, you did, you've learned your NLP and all that sort of stuff, but what was a really important moment that kind of almost shook you to the core in terms of you being a leader, but um, still shows up for you now? So, I mean, I have a story yeah. about responsibility and in, in my own life, uh, appreciating how I wasn't necessarily being responsible and how I could be more responsible. And it shows up for me even now in how I coach yeah. others, in how I run my <laughs> life now. That's the sort of turning point moment I'm looking for. Yeah. What, what oh, feel? right. That's it then. Well, it was, I mean, going right the way back, I didn't want to be an employee of anybody. This is just me personally. No. I'm not suggesting you can't be an employee. I didn't want to be employed. And I employed people. And I found very quickly, like, I didn't want to be that kind of hands-on managing their time and kind of saying, this is your time, get productive in that time it never quite appealed to me. So what I found, these were the things, they're really mundane things that made me think I've done the wrong thing. It was sorting out fire regs <laughs> for our office. It was okay. getting electrical certificates for all the plugs on all the devices in the office. And it was then stakeholder pensions came along and it was like, I've now started this thing that I, all I'm spending my time doing, I'm not doing exciting stuff, I'm administering stuff right. and I'm managing stuff. And I'm oh, managing so what the was that just moment so. that made you what was that moment that really made you sit back and think, oh no, this isn't what I want. What I want is different. Yeah, it was just day after day of seeing admin, like administering things just to have the people in the room. Just to, I mean, we're we're in COVID at the moment, just to have people in a building, the number of extra admin steps involved in that means you spend most of your time administering that. Or I did, and it and yeah. it just became a real drain. So I had a, a conversation with my sister, I said, I can't do this anymore. I don't want to do the commute anymore. I can't. 
um, this isn't what I meant to create and I'm kind of bored. And she said, I am too. She hadn't told me and I hadn't told her. She said, I'm kind of bored too. So we mapped out our perfect day. What would it look like? And it involved, like, number one, not working from an office, not having to commute to an office. And we're talking 2002 when we made that decision. So way before, like, everybody's really clocking onto it now. We were kind yeah. of, we don't need that. And the other one was not employing people. I didn't want employees. The, the strain, the kind of responsibility as a 23-year-old where I was, you know, some of our team were in their 40s. Um, being being kind of somehow, and I, I know in your book you talk about the parent-child thing, you were kind of having to play parent in some of that those interactions i didn't like it it didn't feel it didn't feel humanizing to me it felt the opposite yes um, and so okay. i didn't want to be telling people what to do like that was the thing i, I really didn't like doing either was telling people yeah. what to do yeah tracy i saying you're very ahead of your time <laughs> yeah i think but it was accidental like i wasn't i wasn't planning like this is the way the future's gonna be there was no future thinking it was literally yeah. based around my preference so um, what, what i'm hearing it was a turning point moment in terms of you really learning about yourself yeah and what what gave you energy and what you were good at and playing to your strengths is what i'm yeah. hearing and how is how has that continued through your career and through your so, life i mean partnership again i always find a grown-up so my current grown-up business partner is lucy so the first business we 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 rolled it down we, we turned it back into nothing really we told everybody that we employed we're planning once we decided we don't want to do this anymore we're going to change the direction of the business um we're not planning to employ people we're going to kind of streamline become quite lean um you're not being made redundant but as soon as you find another job it may take a year or two find another job and you, you you've got our blessing go whenever it, it works make it as easy as possible it took about 18 months for everybody to have kind of found their thing. Now, if I'd have known what I know now, I would have found a grown up to buy the business and actually manage a business. That's what we really needed at that point. But I didn't know that then. Yeah. So um, I closed it effectively and it took it took about 18 months um, and then really focused. I wrote a book in the in the same. I co-wrote a book with my business partner, Debs, in that time called The Gorillas yeah. on Bananas. Now, terrible name for a book. It was about lean marketing. So we were really good at marketing. Um Yes. So we wrote this book and we said we're going to we're going to run master classes. So we changed the angle from one to one high value clients to one to many lower cost so we could work with more people. And we were working with coaches, consultants and trainers. And we did that for about three years. And in the process of doing that, we wrote a book. Um, the book did absolutely so amazingly like speaking fees. Uh, Debs, again, I these are the things I do. I always find somebody that can front a business as well. This is what I've done. I, I find a partner that will fill in the gaps I don't really like doing so. Debs was on the stage doing lots of public speaking. We'd speak anywhere, like we'd, I'd get her anywhere, like if we could get her on a stage to sell our stuff. Um, after the book, she started getting paid quite well. <laughs> so I'm like, this this is novel. So I saw all these benefits of having a book. And and then we just, you know, we really enjoyed doing it. We've always loved books. And I, I said, if we did like another 10 of these and they went as well as our book, we could have a viable business just doing books. And so that's what we did. And we started a company, it was called Book Shaker um around 2003 just after our book so it's kind of the end of 2003 yes um we started that business and we said what we vowed to do is never employ anybody again and i've stuck to that I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that with rethink so the rethink so that, team is yeah, about 40 40 plus people now i, I to get the exact number i probably wouldn't know because we keep adding a few but it's probably about 43 people um they're all freelancers like other than me and lucy they're all freelance and they work with us they're self-starters they're entrepreneurial and they're exquisitely skilled at what they're skilled at. And we've got brilliant processes. So for me, if you're not going to employ somebody, that certainty needs to come with really clear process, um, really acknowledging that they're expert as well. So I'm fine to play dumb. Like, I don't know. Like, the people we've got working with us in our team are far better at the things I was doing initially than I ever was. And so I, I go from that point of view is, like, I know nothing. Tell me what you know. Um, and that works really well. And I'm, I'm happy to look stupid. I don't really mind. Yes. Um, yeah. And so I think like, I could kind of say, I know all this stuff. I'm figuring it out as it goes. Like it's emergent. I, I'm yes. still figuring it out as I go along. Yes. But uh, what I'm hearing is what, what's coming across me so clearly is your enthusiasm and your positive energy yeah. about all of this and also recognizing and being open to the fact you can't do this on your own. Yeah. And I think that's also a skill of leadership is recognizing that if you're a leader out there who's thinking I've got to do everything, 
then that's not necessarily leadership. Leadership is about how yeah. you... And I still them. struggle with that. There are things I like doing so much I want to do them. Um, yeah. Even if I'm not best at them, just because I, I, I think I, I like doing that. Um, Can you give me an that's example? That's been a struggle. Um, yeah, me? cover design. We've got we've got a team of five brilliant cover designers. I still want to do all the covers because right. it was the thing I enjoyed doing. You know, it's a skill that I developed. That was the thing yes. I did. Well, it um, sounds like that's a strength as well because that's yeah. what you started with. But so I do like I've got this thing like I, I've got this imaginary thing imagining there's cogs going at like our, our business is brilliant. We think works so brilliantly. We've got and we've got people that are better at building processes than us. Like our production manager, so she's head of publishing now, um, anchor she creates kind of documentation of everything we do and she she's like brilliant and she's onboarding everybody far better than I would have ever done it. And she's created that certainty I couldn't really give as the team's grown. Um, but I, I've got this kind of visual in my head when I know I'm doing it, which is me poking my fingers in the cogs. Everything's running yeah. smoothly and I don't need to poke it anymore. I'm supposed to yeah. be directing it. Where is it supposed to be going? Um, yeah. and I find that really exciting and challenging because I do like, doing stuff but yeah you're right you know it's finding it's finding that and knowing you can't do it yourself is important yes um, and that's a lesson I have to keep reminding myself and I'm also hearing that what you've got now in, in Rethink Press is kind of the, a model of a very modern organization yeah. in that you're keeping your overheads really low you're you're tapping into the talent that's out there in the market yeah. and it makes you incredibly flexible to deal with all the uncertainty yeah so I, I don't like to kind of say this because I know a lot of businesses have struggled but we didn't skip a beat in terms of delivery with COVID because we already work in that locked down you yeah. know the, the new world for everybody else was our normal because I didn't want to employ people and and here's the thing about the employee like there's kind of this this dynamic potentially if you get it wrong in a business and I think I was getting it wrong with my first business of leader follower yeah like the leader says where you know managing rather than leading and what I found is everybody that works with us they're leaders in their own right they're self-leaders they're, they're already self-leaders um, and, and for me that that means I can acknowledge them as equals there's never any kind of telling anybody what to do yeah. And it's not just about, fo I mean, in organisations and the big corporate structures, there is an element of leading leaders and followers. Yeah. And there's something about that potentially that as a construct can be disempowering. Yeah. So, you know, it's about everyone has the potential to be leaders. And if you're a leader, how are you helping other people step up as leaders yeah. as well? Yeah. Joe, it has been really fantastic today. I'm conscious of time, and um, it, oh, I can go on. That's a problem. Twenty minutes. How, how I mean, it's impossible to stay within twenty minutes. I think for for you with your energy and enthusiasm, and also the experiences that you've shared, some really rich lessons there for all of us about leadership. Yeah. I'd like to ask you as your parting shot: what advice do you pass on? to the people that are out there that, may, you know, Tracy, Ann and, and Ganesh are out there, but also people watching this after we've recorded it. What's the advice you pass on to them about leadership? Um, I think it's getting out of the way and acknowledging other people have got strengths. And I, I think I've been really good at that because I've been able to acknowledge my weaknesses from the beginning. Um, and I see that as an opportunity rather than a, the opportunity is I, if, if you know your gaps, you can fill them. And that right. gives you the opportunity to work with someone else and, and to acknowledge their their perfection, even if it's not your perfection. We yes. both got kind of complementary perfections. Yes. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's to me is just just know that you can find people that work and, and kind yes. of complement you perfectly. Yes. That's fantastic. So that really is about engaging with the diversity, recognizing strengths being being having the humility as a leader to own up to the fact you haven't got all the strengths you know you yeah. do need to bring other people on board some fantastic lessons there thank you so much for being such an inspiring Thanks, guest joe um to, to everyone who's watching to tracy to ganesh to everyone who's watching this in follow-up um do join us again next Friday. There'll be another Lessons in Leadership. I don't know who that's going to be yet. I will let you know during the week. Keep your eyes open. But it really is a complete honour for me to engage with people like you, Joe, and hear your lessons you. that we can then share with everybody else. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mary. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.